when the lunacy becomes normal, that's what you want. Like when the when 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 the obsession with what you're doing to be the best becomes normal, that's when you got something. And I feel really blessed. I have a fantastic team. I have people who are just as obsessed with being great as I am. Mm. They wanna they want to be a part of something that's impactful in the community. That, um not only in locally but nationwide like you know the, the, that's it, it's just so uh, they inspire me with how hard they go so believe me please bring your kids um bring um, i would love to do another one of these yeah i would love to, um, I would love to do maybe a live q a so people can really you know get get questions you know I'm I'm a wealth of knowledge man I know that's real a lot of people, people want to know you know how how to scale how to do certain things even from the mental health aspect of it because I'm really big on that because a lot of business owners aren't you know heavy they neglect that part of themselves they neglect that mental health side and um, I've, I've had a conversation with you before yeah oh yeah you know, this drive to be great is it's a lonely road. And, you know, it's important that you're taking care of your mental health. It's it's a it's a ton of things that we can touch on to um to make sure that we're getting the word out. We're talking about business, we're talking about um growth, because this is how our communities um this is how we can scale our communities. This is how we can improve our schools. It's all it's all intertwined. It's all mm-hmm. connected. It's all connected. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to Friends with Businesses, where I introduce you to my friends with ben- with businesses, and you will benefit. <laughs> there you go. You like don't, like don't don't flip up, don't flip up. Hey man, don't 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 do that. Don't do it the other way. So so look, y'all. All right. So this this today today is a special day, right? This 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 is my big brother. You know, normally I got folks that are known and I be helping, but this man has truly truly helped me. So normally what I do, how I start it off is I like to have them introduce themselves. Before that, I got to give my man his flowers, right? I ain't never told him all this stuff. This stuff about, I'm about to say right now, right? So. As you can see, he's a Hamptonian like myself, you know, a very proud Hamptonian or whatever. But anyway, so just, just a bit about me. I don't really even tell my story. But, you know, when I got to Hampton, barely by the skin of my teeth, the grace of God that I made it there, um, you know, I wanted to carry things a certain way. Like I was like, you know, and, and nobody really knew my, my, my past, you know. Um, I did a lot of good stuff, bad stuff, whatever, neither here nor there. But there was a lot in me. Um, you know, I was always in leadership roles. I was always doing stuff. But I went to Hampton. I didn't want to do that no more. I just wanted to go there, get my degree, and chill. I didn't even feel, feel like I fit in at Hampton because, you know, being from Landover, Kentland, it's a lot different than where a lot of Hamptonians came from. <laughs> but um, when I got there, you know, I did my thing uh, freshman year, hung out with just people from D.C. or whatever. And there was there was some – there was a, a few brothers there who – uh basically kept getting on me. And this was one of them, saying, you know, you need to you need to step out your shell. Don't just try to be like every other DC dude. You got something in you. And again, like I said, they didn't know my story. They didn't know the trainings that I've been in, the things that, that my pastor had taught me, all this type of stuff. All they knew is that Carl needed to do something outside of what he was doing. And they pressed me, they pressed me. And I really, I still wasn't trying to do it because I'm saying like, man, I'm not trying to prance around in no suit in Ogden Hall. That's just, <laughs> that's just not me. But, but really, what, what? Uh, but honestly, um, I gotta thank this man because it really changed my the entire trajectory of my Hamptonian career. You know, between him, Wendell, Mark, Aaron, you know, some, some real good brothers who just, you know, they they didn't let me just be like everybody else. And so I gotta thank you because. Because of the, you know, of course, uh, other things played uh, played a role, but you all gave me strong encouragement to step outside the box. And that really made me want to do more, you know, want to make it happen, want to really. And, and you know, I can say proudly that I, I did Hampton right. 
you know, I, I, you know, became a student leader, you know, even a leader amongst the student leaders. I still keep in contact with Mr. Mangana. And even now I'm passing that on. I still go back to the school now and speak to the student leaders. That's only because I stepped outside my box. And that's only because y'all was like, hey, you're not going to sit here and just be a regular old, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> in the state. So, yeah, I just had to give you that off break. Okay. And now you can introduce yourself. All right. So uh, thank you for that. That's really dope, man. Um it's funny you say that because it's so many people who you named in that conversation, a few that you may have left out, you know, not left out, but you didn't mention that did some of the same things for me. Uh, when you talk about where you come from, you know, challenging circumstances and things like that. Same thing here. I'm from um, Southeast D.C., uh, didn't come from a place of a lot of means and things like that. Um, and going down there, you know, uh, just for lack of a better word, I had a chip on my shoulder, right? Yeah. So I get exactly what you're saying. Um, but one thing that our school did do for us is that it gave us um, an understanding that there's a better way. And uh, it gave us, above all, like lifelong friendships, lifelong connections, and people we can always call on for anything, 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 whether it be personal, professional, uh, you name it. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, my, name is, my name, me, I am Dr. Raphael Joshua Denbo, the second, or did I put the second in, want to uh, recognize my pops. Um, I am a business owner. Um, I am a dad. I am a husband, brother, the whole nine, um, serial entrepreneur. But uh, my primary business is physical therapy and wellness. Uh, I've been in private practice for 13 years. I've been a physical therapist for almost 20 years. Um, I oh, own, man. Oh. I own, yeah, I'm old. I own multiple clinics. The name of my business is Portera Rehabilitation. We provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy services, and a whole lot more. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of my the, the core of my main business. I also do some consulting on the side. And I also have a, a lifestyle brand I'm uh, getting off the ground currently. So um, I'm so honored and grateful that you um, asked me to be on the on the uh, on the podcast, and um, I'm looking forward to just being able to talk with you and talk to anybody who's following you, anybody who is who is um, a listener, follower, etc., and just you know getting the getting the myths out of like what it is to be a business owner, um, you know. <laughs> what it is and what it isn't like that's really that's really what i want to put out there yeah man and, and you know we could we could, i mean if you want to you go a little bit down the story of how you got into physical therapy because you know that's not something that most people just jump into so how did that even happen oh my super villain how my, my super villain story all right well <laughs> i became a super villain um um like i said uh prior um i went to a school in washington dc Eastern Senior High School, uh, I'd say Pride of Capitol Hills, what they call it. Um, back then, they had a program called the Health and Human Services Academy. And what they did is they allowed you to go around and kind of try different health professions. Um, because we live in a federal city, you could do um, government work. I work for the Bureau of Primary Health Care. I work for NRH. I did a whole bunch of different things in the middle um, but when I went to go volunteer at the now defunct uh, D.C. General Hospital, um, I had a chance to intern with physical therapists and occupational therapists. And and I just fell in love with the profession. I fell in love with working with people. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with um, I'm an instant gratification guy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> with, as far as my work, I like to see where my work is going. I like to see the results of my work. So it it really was a good fit for me as far as um, being able to work with people and see, okay, I can't walk now, I can walk. I can't stand now, I can stand. So just learning those techniques and things like that to help people get better. And then also identifying that our community specifically when it comes to healthcare outcomes, 
just you know it, there's a there's a wide gap in what is needed and what's available and i wanted to be one of those kinds of people to fill in those gaps oh man that, that that's that, that's amazing so uh, and look, you know, I got stories for days, right? You, and you know, I always tell this one that <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, it was 2015 and my mother had an injury right. and as she got, you know, of course, she, you know, went and had the, the procedure, whatever needed to get done. And they sent her to physical therapy and I'm sitting in a meeting at work and I know my, my mother's emergency contact. And I knew she had to go to the doctor that day mm-hmm. and the phone rang and I had to answer it. And, <laughs> um, they like, I'm like, why is everything okay? You know, and she like, somebody here wants to talk to you. And I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and she had the phone and somebody says something that only me and this person would know what it means, right? Oh. And I was like, smooth. <laughs> yeah. And so we sitting there and my mother is being taken care of by my big brother from Hampton. Had no idea, you know, and that's just how it works. It was just serendipity. Um, She was talking, I guess it was some time a year. um, I think it was kind of around this time, kind of fall. Mm -hmm. We do things like, um, like we do like home, like a homecoming theme. And I wore my Hampton stuff. And she was like, well, my son went to Hampton. I was like, okay, what's your son's name? And she said, call Gray. I was like, oh, Lord. I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. So do you know my son? I said, absolutely. I know your son. Uh, you know, and it, the rest was history. But, yeah, it was a pleasure working with her. It was a pleasure, um, you know, uh, just understanding that, you know, everything comes back around. It's just, it was just incredible. So that was, that was, that was, that was truly a, a a full circle moment for me. And yeah, really, and me too. And like you said, you know, you end up with these lifetime relationships that actually, you know, it's like, do you know, like, ah, uh, you, you don't get that a lot. Like, like, like kind of sort of. No, nah, it's like we actually know, 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 <laughs> know each other, right? But right. um, so you, you said you told us your your, your super villain origin story. Uh, <laughs> I like that though. Um, but what made you start your what made you go crazy? And start your own practice. <laughs> Look, we all know that th- this ain't an easy, tr- ain't an easy track. But what made you do that? Okay, well, um, background. Um, I am a third generation entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. This is not something a lot of people know about me. Uh, nah. My family is originally from Guyana in South America. Okay? Ah, okay. So my grandmother um, used to sell stuff. Like if you know, if you've gone to different countries anywhere you travel you know there's a market like you know there's always some outdoor mm-hmm. market that sort of thing yeah my grandmother did that for to, to help take care of my father and my aunts and uncles mm-hmm. when um when she was you know she was raising them so she did that her entire life like from, i think from like the time my father was born until she passed away in like the mid 90s she was still doing that my father immigrated to this country in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, he, you know, worked and did some things. And then he got laid off in the 80s, like when technology started taking off, he got laid off from his job. And he just kind of went back to his roots doing things like that. So when I turned, uh, this is funny, when I turned 11, I started working with my father. Mm. And I worked with my dad at his business doing things just like that. So not only did we do like flea markets and things like that, we used to also um, send stuff back. So we would export things like from the U.S. from there to um, from from the U.S. to Guyana and still sell things. So my dad was running kind of like a flea market thing here and then an import export thing back at home. So I worked with him from the time again, from the time I was 11 to the time I became a physical therapist. Like I was literally 24 years old. And my father was like, all right, you got your own job now. You're making your own money. You can, <laughs> I don't need you working with me anymore. <laughs> all right, right, right. So, that, now that, that, that's, see, that, that's what I had no idea. And go figure you a guy in these. Here's why. So my business partner and mentor, um, he's Guyanese. The okay. firm I used to work for, uh, Basilio Cobb Associates, ran by a Guyanese gentleman. Um, and one thing about y'all, y'all always on point. Like, you, I've never seen a non-well-dressed Guyanese person ever in life. Hold on. If you're talking about dressing, you got the wrong person. I'm, I'm, but see, but y'all never, but y'all never come like, y'all don't come raggedy. 
Oh no, no, no. That's what I'm saying. It's all it's always like, nah, we're we gonna be we're gonna be sharp though. Yeah, <laughs> we gonna make sure. I'm gonna do the t-shirt, I'm gonna do t-shirt and jeans well. Yes, sir. Right, but yeah, but it, but it's gonna be sharp though. But it's like all right, <laughs> my, my my white tee gonna be crisp and white. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, man, so Okay, so you had the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial bug in you. So how did you, you know, branch off? Because I know most, most people don't know how to get out of what they're doing. Like I was kind of forced out uh, <laughs> because you know the firm, you know, some things happened at the firm, and you know they split off uh, the, what I was doing. So, but how did you actually get to do it? Okay, well, um, my first, my first, not my first job. It was kind of like my first real foray into really not taking physical therapy seriously. That's not what I mean, but really jumping into a place where I felt like I really fit. It was another small business, mm -hmm. uh, black owned business for, um, for gentlemen who I work for, for young black guys. They were probably no, probably no, probably in their mid thirties. And they were really dynamic. They had a lot of, um, offices and um, clinics and hospitals that they were servicing through their staffing company. Mm -hmm. Started to work for them. Um, I worked for them for about five years. They they were just so great about teaching me the ropes and showing me uh, what it took to have a small business, what it took to work in the area of rehab. I met so many different people and uh, people who I'm still in contact with today. Um, they gave me kind of my first shot, you know, and when we uh, when we went our separate ways, it was mainly because of I knew that I was outgrowing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. When I was there, I had gotten, you know, contracts and things like that. And I knew it kind of rubbed them the wrong way that I was kind of kind of doing my own thing after hours or, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, yeah. And I felt like it was just the right time to to go and really step out on my own. Now, <laughs> the step out was the thing. Like, it was it's real easy to be booked and busy when you got a nine to five. Right. <laughs> as soon as you step out, that contract that you got that's making you a few thousand dollars on the side, that's not really, that might not pay the mortgage, you know. That nope. might, might keep the, you know... Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a tough journey there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, newborn baby. I was newly married, married for about a weird year and a half. And it was, you know, pretty stressful, you know, to trying to get it off the ground. But like I said, when I had a few opportunities at the time to do some things, I um, worked and I made the money and enough and I just, I didn't spend it. I wasn't, you know, I'm not a flashy guy, I'm not somebody who, you know, I don't need the watches and the cars and all of that. So I just saved my money because I knew that I was going to do something different. I knew that I was going to launch this business. So I made sure that um, I was prepared. You know, there's a line on a song by uh, was it Tupac on Against All Odds. He said, um, you know, you can't go to war until you got your money right. You know, now I got my money right. Now I want war. And that's how I, felt. Mm -hmm. so I was like, all right, I got, you know, got a few dollars now. I, I can take some chances. You know, so that's what allowed me to really step out and do it in a real broad way. Yeah. So one, I want to rewind a little bit because you, you shared something that reminds me of even part of part of my journey. You said in working for a small black business, same way I did work for, you know, considered I'm still technically considered a small business, even though it was the largest minority uh, consultant firm in the country, but you get to learn a lot of the ropes that people don't get to learn everywhere else. You know, the, the business development piece, the, like you said, getting contracts, dealing, having relations, not just the hands-on, which is of course important, the practical stuff, but those things behind the scenes and the infrastructure piece. So what types of things did you learn um, while you were there that kind of prepared you to start your own? Oh man, I I was able to do quite a bit in my stint with uh, the company. Um, the company was called Ergo Solutions. Uh, I had a few things going on with them, uh, but when I was there, they al they allowed me. Excuse me. They allowed me to go and you know learn the business of the business. Mm -hmm. 
right people they understand um like as a physical therapist you know how to do the technical part of physical therapy but you don't understand the healthcare landscape in a in a real way you don't mm-hmm. understand you know how do how do you turn the work that you do into money not money from me like if you're working for me yes you got to pay your rate you get paid right but how do I turn your work into money? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a piece that I was able to learn working with them, that piece. And I also learned some things as far as administration, understanding um, regulatory work and things like that, because regulatory is a big piece that a lot of people miss when they go on into a business. They think about, you know, just paying. I, I, I give a service, you give me money. But there is, depending on the business, there's regulatory things you have to make sure that you have together. There's a legal and tax and um, other considerations that you have to have, you know, sewn up. Yeah. Before you can really take off as a business owner. Yeah, and I, I like you said, those those type of things. You know, for those who are looking to start your, I mean, of course, if you're doing something on the side, that's one thing. But like you said, when you start having to pick up employees and you start to, you know, I mean, in your field, you know, you got HIPAA regulations, you got, you know, all types of certifications you got to maintain and all of that. We got to think about those things. You're like, yeah, I want to get it. Like, I, you know, count the cost first. There, there's some things that there's, there's some things that's going to throw you for a loop if you're not, um, if you're not prepared. So, let, let's talk about where, where, where you are now in business. You know, I had the I had the, the, the opportunity to come to your most recent opening uh, way, way out in Wakandaville. Far as a mug, drove an hour to get there. But hey, listen, you got to go, you know, businesses. One thing we got to talk to uh, small businesses. If I had to say anything, man, listen, money is a, the money is where the edges are. Yeah. Money is not in the middle. Everybody want to stay in the middle and make money. The middle has been staked out. You got to go to those edges where nobody's there, mm-hmm. where the wave, you're still waiting for the wave to come in. You got to get there. So, yes, I just opened my third office uh, in White Plains, Maryland, in Charles County. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing fantastic. We just had our 1,000th visit. We've only been open about five, six months. So we've already had our 1,000th visit. Uh, that's a milestone for us. Um, we're, um, we're still looking to, you know, fully staff it out, but I mean, it's been, it's been tremendous. Like this, the outpouring from, uh, that community, they really accepted us very quickly and, you know, they see the value in what we bring and we want to make sure that we are, um, living up to their expectations. So it's been, it's been, um, it's been really great. Uh, we've been open about six months. Next week will be six months. Yeah. Six months. All right. And, and see, that 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 sounds successful, but let's let's get down to brass tacks, right? People want to know how well, successful. Like, what you what 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 the, what, the, what the numbers looking like? What their money looking like? What the numbers looking like? Okay, we can we can talk numbers. I don't like to get into numbers specifics. They gotta be specific, but yeah. six figures, seven figures, what be looking like? Um, my I have a seven figure business. My business does uh, seven figures. Uh, we've been in the seven figures since two thousand and nineteen. Nice. Um, the the pandemic hit us, uh, you know, a little harder than most. Right, because in person, yeah. So you know, but um, we were able to weather the storm, make it through, and even grow through the pandemic. Nice. So, How'd you do that? Wait, hold on. Hold, how? Because how, how, you know, everybody act like you know nobody could make it through the pandemic. How'd you grow? Okay. Well, growing, uh, growing through the pandemic was mainly based off of what I like, like of my first principles of just not only just business, but of my life. So number one is always living below your means, always spending below your means, always making sure that um, you're not uh, overdoing it. So even when we were making, you know, let's say, let me see, in 2019, I think we did $1.2 million. Mm-hmm. So that's 2019. So at close of, close of the day, at midnight, New Year's Eve, midnight, you know, we had made 1.2, just under $1.3 million. Yeah. 
I gave myself a bonus of like three thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, what? What? I mean, nah, that's smart. That's smart. I mean, you know, because th- this is the thing, right? It, you don't know what's coming tomorrow, right? True. So, I did that. I paid, gave my staff a bonus. Everybody got some money, you know, because we, had, you know, it was really important to me to make sure I celebrate them, let them know all of that, all of their hard work, everything. Make sure they were good. We did a fantastic. Um, um, a holiday party, all of that stuff for that time of year, which we generally do, and gave our bonuses, gifts, the whole thing. Like we just did it up. Took care of my people first, and then I was like, "Yeah, I give myself, you know, three thousand dollars." All right, <laughs> but when the pandemic came, we were prepared, right? So <laughs> we had we had funds to weather the storm. We had uh, capital to uh we didn't we hadn't extended all our lines of credit or anything like that we weren't overspenders we were very um very frugal okay. so when those challenges came we were able to weather the initial uh problems that came through financially and then what we did was we just really started working our outstanding money so like money that people just owed us mm. When, when you're doing well, you can let that money kind of float out there for you know six months, nine months, a year. But once you start noticing, okay, well, we're not, you know, our volume is down forty percent, but our revenues need to pretty much stay stable. We started working that, working those old bills, and we ended up, even our business was down. Like forty percent, our receivables and revenue was only down about fifteen. Oh wow! Yeah, no, that's that's no, that's great, man. So yeah, I mean, so I mean, just I mean, gotta gotta have a a, a it's, it's all strategic, like you said. Mm-hmm. It's all strategic. And it seemed like you know that was kind of like a rainy day fund that you ended up having that you didn't even know you had. No, that's that that's that's dope, bro. But um, exactly. so. Mm-hmm. We did do the PPP and we did all those things, but a lot of those things were for, um, again, paycheck protection. Right, right. Um, what I want your, what I want your listeners to understand and what your viewers understand is that the growth of the business shouldn't be viewed as kind of like uh, making sure that you make payroll. That's not growth. No. Nah. Um, so being able to make payroll and then grow is, I mean, being able to make payroll in that time was paramount because we wanted to keep the people engaged and we wanted them working and that sort of thing. But also having your business grow also means that you have to make sure that you have a plan for what we call black swan events, like stuff that you just can't imagine, like you know, the pandemic was something that's very, very, um, very unpredictable. Nobody could have predicted that. But things, you know, something happens in the building where you're hosting your your business and say it's a fire in the building, maybe not in your space, but it's a fire in the building, or there's a flood in the building, or uh, just something, you know, something incredible that happens and you just can't sustain your business where you are. So you have to have some some sort of a backup. Yeah. Be able to feel weather the storm if something happens. No, that's that's amazing. Now I want to talk about your growth because you said you know of course you started off with one, now you're at three. How do you know when to expand? Because you know a lot of people we have visions for expansion, visions for growth. Some people they want to get a facility, and it's like it might not be time for a facility yet. You know that type. So how do you know when to grow? Because obviously you did it right because in five months a thousand visits. That's amazing. So you have to know something about timing and all that. How, how do you know when to do that? Okay. Um, well, the first thing I would tell any of your viewers to do is mm-hmm. when you have your business, if you've had it long enough. So I was mm-hmm. blessed that my first business worked first, first right off the bat. My mm-hmm. first worked right off the bat. I mean, it was just, I was incredibly blessed. It was nothing but good fortune so with that being said the gap between clinic one and clinic two was four years 
the gap between clinic two and clinic three was nine years. Mm. And it wasn't because we didn't have the money. It wasn't because we didn't have the facilities. I mean, at the facility, the patients or the, you know, the demand. It was that, that we didn't have process. We didn't have policy, procedure. We were still looking for the right people. So it was a ton of different things that go into understanding when it's time to expand. Because the worst possible thing you can do, okay, when you're going into expansion is going broad, right, without having the people and without having the processes to help support that expansion. Mm -hmm. um, so when I talk about the people, I'm talking about managers, um, human resources professionals that you can contract out. You don't have to have an HR in your office. Human resources professionals. When I talk about policies and procedures, I'm talking about, do you have a policy and procedures, man? Right. Do you have standard operating procedures? Do you have job descriptions? Mm -hmm. All of these things, these rules and regulations and things that you can hand to somebody, this is what I expect of you. These are your indicators of success. These are the things you need to do. This is what you need to be in order for the company to, you know, to benefit from you being here and you benefit from being with the company. All of that needs to be laid out. If you don't have that, then now you have this organization that's just spread, but still nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows what it's supposed to be. It's just, it's chaos. And until I really buckled down and did that work, it was going to be impossible for us to, to grow. Now, there are some other factors that go into understanding your growth as well. Um, one thing, one thing you have to do is you got to know your audiences, know who who you're who you're going after. You know, but that was again a part of our policies, and part of our procedures, and part of our, our part of our process. Who are you looking for, right? Who's your who's your who's your customer? Mm -hmm. right? Her name is Sylvia. That's how granular. Get the avatar locked down. Understanding who our customer is, we had to we created an archetype. Mm -hmm. Who she is, we said because we know it's a as we know it's a black female college educated, um, black female college educated um, between the ages of thirty seven and fifty seven. Mm -hmm. That's who Sylvia is, right? That's who she is. That's her name. The, the, that's the name I gave her. No, yeah, that's our customer. Yeah, that's what we teach. Yeah, we, you gotta have, because I, I tell I tell my clients, um, you have to know your 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 market, your 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 client, your avatar as much as you know yourself. Like you know how they gonna react to stuff that's happening in the world. You know, are they gonna come out in the snow? Just because you go out in the snow, don't mean she will. Doesn't mean she's gonna come out in the snow. And you have to know what you have to know what Sylvia wants. You have to know mm -hmm. um, what Sylvia's needs are. You got to know what her. Uh, pain points are you have to understand her understand that client through and through and if you don't understand that client through and through what's going to happen is you're going to you're going to lose the plot so to speak in your business because you're no longer going to be serving her and wondering why I, you know i keep saying her because i right no that's, that makes sense yeah client um you're going to be kind of you know kind of flailing trying to get different things and different people and it's not it's, that's not who are the people who got you they say dance with the person who got you yeah. yeah so all right now with your with all three of your locations i mean they're in different places do they all operate exactly the same or is it how does that work yes when i say operate exactly the same um our original office is still our uh Flagship, busiest, busiest office. Okay. Our newest office is our kind of our flagship. Okay, got it. We were able to build from the ground up. It was actually a purchase. We purchased that location, so we don't. Um, we're now in the. We've now expanded not only to a third location, but we're in the real estate business now. 
that where now we own the place where we do business, which gives us um, even, even a larger foothold uh, with regards to how we can operate and do business. We're not, mm-hmm. we, we don't lease, we own uh, land in order to, you know, now, now when I pay rent, I'm paying me. Right. Right. So, <laughs> So now, if I go say five years, six years in this current location, and it's time to open another one. Well, I'll be opening another one in, in twenty twenty five. But and it's time to open another one. Now I can leverage that location, leverage that asset now to purchase or to open another location. Mm. So those are the kinds of things that operating at this level affords you to do. Um, because it, it's just, it kind of, like I said, it, for me, it was a natural evolution. I got tired of just paying people rent and not really seeing any uh, ROI on it. No, no, that, 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 that's crazy. And I want you to kind of delve a little bit in, cause I know you said you wanted to mention it's like, the, and people call it play, they call it move, whatever, whatever people want to call it, but it's that expansion of. I'm not just this. I'm also this now. You know, that's how, you know, McDonald's operate. McDonald's is a real estate company, not even a restaurant for the most part. You know, it's it's, it's that type of stuff. So what even made you come across it? How do you even look at the landscape of your, of anybody? Look at the landscape of your industry and say, hey, I need to do this so that I have the leverage to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Where where did you even get that from? Okay. Um, Well, like I said before, I'm a, as my intro, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I'm not, I don't just own the physical therapy company. I also um, own a couple of uh, properties that are uh, residential. So we own like three residential properties between my wife and I. And uh, we always talked about working together. And so now we've started becoming very uh, intentional about the work that we do now. So if she's kind of, she's on the real estate side. So we have a company called Dembo Real Estate and Management, D R E A M. So dream. Dream. Nice. <laughs> nice. So, um we work together in that vein. So she was my real estate agent on finding this location. Um so being able to blend the two. So she's on the real estate side and I'm on the healthcare side. So now if as the healthcare business grows, we could also grow our real estate portfolio on the other side. So again, we leverage those assets to create other um, business assets on the healthcare side and then turn around and then use those healthcare assets to that generates the revenue to buy more real estate assets, which does. So it just kind of feeds on itself. Now that, that's amazing. Now I know you noticed uh, uh, about me, <laughs> Um, you know, I've, you know, guest coach, business coach, business solution architect, all that stuff. But I'm, I'm really becoming more invested in the next generation, okay. right? You know, as a, as a 41 year old man, I look back and I'm like, I'm, I'm the old head now. I'm, I'm up. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm up. I'm the old man. Now. I'm the one showing up at the schools. Um, and and you know, I, I try not to be the old man in the club. When I when I look at them like yo come on, but I, I look and sometimes I get I get a little worried. I do okay. when I when I hear them talk. You know, I mean, we had we had great success in the camp that we did over the summer. You know, working with them, but that's a you know a re- relatively small portion. But even still, I got to check them sometimes uh, with what we're doing. So what what could you say to them if they would listen? <laughs> Like right now, because, you know, we always say, if I knew then what I know now, like, what do you want them to know? And and in a way that they'd be able to grasp it as they hear and they see it. From a business perspective, like what it. What man, it, bro, just talk to them, man. <laughs> you know how you, t- you t- I get a, I get a chance, you know, every now and then to talk to. Um, I think it's coming up later on this year. I talked to students at uh, Dunbar High School in D.C. Mm-hmm. when they were at. Um, our friend Jasmine. Jasmine went to Hampton with us as well. She has an entrepreneurship program that she runs out of um, some of the schools. She's an entrepreneurship teacher and some other things like that. So she, I, I generally go up there and I talk to them as well. And the thing that I always tell them is that whatever you get into, know the business that you're in. Not, not um, 
not how to sell t-shirts, but no t-shirts. Right. Know where the cotton comes from. Know where the needles come from. Know who does the sewing. Know who does, you know, know the difference between a three-panel shirt and a five-panel shirt. Know the difference between a, a size seam shirt and a non-size seam shirt. Understand um, how the shirts are going to react when they're washed. Understand how the shirt's going to react when they're ironed. Know it through and through. Know your business all the way through. Because mm-hmm. if you know your business all the way through, it allows you to make better decisions with regards to how you're going to proceed. And you can always beat out the person that's just quote unquote, selling the shirts or doing the therapy or has a consulting firm. If you understand what consultants do, if you understand the power of your knowledge base, if you understand the, the, if you understand it, if you understand it in and out, like, like, you know, the business, like the back of your hand, you become unstoppable because now you have a knowledge base that not only people in your industry can benefit from, but people outside of your industry can benefit from. Because I guarantee you, once you go delve deep enough into any business, you're going to learn legal things that you didn't know. You're going to learn regulatory things you didn't know. You're going to learn things about um, import export or mm-hmm different uh, facets of the commerce that you're doing that a whole ton of people don't know. And then also there's this intersectionality with business that a lot of people don't may, may or may not be to be aware of in all facets of business. I mean, I have friends of mine who work in banking and when I have a banking issue, <laughs> Uh, not like, you know, swiping ATM card banking, but literally banking, like getting funds, getting money, uh, lending, borrowing, whatever it is, I can call them and they know banking so deeply at a fundamental level that they'll tell me like, oh, well, you know, from a healthcare person right now in the banking, um, new healthcare is looked at this way or, Mm -hmm. you know, so-and-so is looked out that way versus, going and just asking a bank teller right right okay yeah bank teller works at a bank Mm -hmm. but they don't really know banking yeah see what i mean yeah oh yeah not necessarily don't necessarily know banking right versus somebody who works in banking on the finance side works on the banking on the lending side who's really deep 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 like knee deep or shoot chest deep in it the nuances, they yeah. Way more than somebody who just works at the bank. And so many people who are starting businesses or who are in business, they don't understand that even when you're starting, that's the end point. You have to know that business through and through. Right. Yeah. And I and I think that's something that, you know, I because I work with people who are like really they're trying to turn their idea or their side hustle into a business, right? And they think that there's some magic pill or magic formula to do it. No, there are systems that we got in, that we can put in place, there are things, but it's really up to them. Like I tell them, I know business, you know your industry. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I would I would never sit there and try to tell you how to fix somebody's, you know, shoulder, but you got to know even, like you say, even further than that, what's the new technology? You got to say, you got to stay ahead of the game. You can't expect me to stay ahead of the game. The only person when it comes, when you are the CEO of your own company, you are the CEO of your own company. It's up to you to stay ahead of that game. So I'm really glad that you said that. And that's something not only for the students to understand, but adults too, you know, because so often, like you said, they jump into the deep end um, without, a, with a, you know, like, and can't swim. It's like, it's, and and then they like think somebody gonna rescue them. I'm like mm, nine to five. I've had a ton of people over the past uh, three years who have been clinical people who work for me, who have made the decision, and you know, rightly so. Whatever's for you is for you. Mm-hmm. Jump in and say they want to be business owners. Um. They want to be independent contractors or they want to own their own clinics and they want to do certain kind of, they want to do work, do that work a certain way. And I applaud them doing it. I applaud them going out and pushing themselves uh, to the max and trying to see whether they can grow 
and fill in that gap and become what they want to become. Mm-hmm. Never downplay anybody for doing that. That's, no. a, that's a huge thing. Right. But one thing they have to understand is that there are no guarantees in this game. Right. You can have a fantastic idea. You can have a fantastic service. You can have great uh, policies, procedures, people, product, everything, and still fail. Yeah. Right? You can have none of that and succeed for a time, but if you don't ramp up and get that stuff going, that's going to be a failure. There is so much complexity to what we do and it's some people who are born to do it there's some people who were raised to do it Mm -hmm. and you know it's it's an inexact science the only thing that i found that in common myself in common with a ton of other business owners is that we have a certain level of perfectionism um that can sometimes border on uh insanity sometimes yeah, yeah. Um, because when you see the vision you want that vision to be down to like mm, that look that thread wasn't like that that thread was pointed east like that level of um specificity um and then we have a tenacity like we just don't give up like right we don't we we don't like losing. We don't like how losing feels. We don't like how failure feels, and so we really push the envelope really really hard. And some people are okay with things just being so so. And if that's you, you can have a business. You can you can still be that kind of person, and have a business that works and that um, makes some money and you know, but. In good times, let me say that you can have a business that does that in good times. Mm-hmm. But when the tough times come, you're going to need a lunatic to get to get you through. You're going to need somebody with grit, with tenacity, and just the desire to be great. Like you're going to you're going to need that because right now we're going through tough times. Like the pandemic came through, and we're going in a year. Four. We're actually in year four, going into year five of trying to survive this, and as a, as people, as businesses, and we're seeing the businesses who were prepared are thriving. They're still, you know, making their way, and there are other businesses who are starting to fall back, and you're starting to see that maybe they didn't have the right plans, or maybe they didn't have the right leadership, or maybe they're uh, business has run its course. Um, all businesses have a hundred percent failure rate. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah. Right. Every business. Goldman Sachs has been around two, three hundred years. One day it's going to fail. Mm-hmm. Okay. Apple is on a hell of a run. One day it's going to fail. Hundred percent failure rate. Right. But just what you can learn from it, what you can extract from it, and above all. Um, how much you can grow from it as an individual, as the owner, CEO, president, whatever you call yourself, that's the big challenge. How much can you grow from it? How come it how it can push you to become better, be a better person, and be a better, you know, whatever it is, whatever role you find yourself. Man, smooth, big bro, Dr. Raphael J. Dimbo the <laughs> second. Man, look, I, I appreciate that. Was that man? That was, that was a closer because the last thing I was gonna ask was, was some, give me a give me a, a a gem to leave with the people. But man, you just gave my whole diamond man right there, bro. Oh, you got one? They want to know. Oh, you want something? Oh, hey, man, I got I got stuff. Hey, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. G- g- give me a gem. Give me a gem. Give me a gem. Like, yeah. th- what's the best advice you've ever gotten? Oh man, the best <laughs> advice I've ever gotten. That's a good one. So I've gotten some really good advice. Yeah. I've got some really good things. Um, let me tell you something that I, I try to live by then, um, is uh, don't don't take anything personal. Do not. Do not. Mm. Don't, do not take this business stuff personal. Mm. Say, well, I take my business, you know, 
I always take my business personal because I care about my business this much. And this is how I should take. Don't do not take it personally. Don't take it personal. Yeah. People can't help you because they can't help you. Right. People don't. Um, people don't buy from you because they don't buy from you. Um, your family not supporting you because they just not supporting you. It's not because they don't love you, because they don't care about you, because they want you to fail, because they want to see that that's a narrative that you're telling yourself. That's mm. not right. People aren't supporting you because they don't know how, right? Or they don't know that you need support. If you're the type of person that's going to start a business, run a business, you're generally the person that everybody else looks to for support. Yep. 100%. You're the person, you're the leader, you're the person who stands out, steps out, so people don't know how to offer their gifts to you. They may believe that their gifts aren't worthy or whatever that is. Um, They don't know. Mm -hmm. That's personal when people don't follow you or people don't spend with you or people don't it's not personal yeah everybody's walking around their own world their own bubble doing doing things right so your job as a business owner is to become undeniable that's your job you got to be the person that people are like oh my gosh this person is doing so well i i just i, I have to spend my money with them mm, mm. right I have to spend my money. I have to go over there. I have to go support them. I have to like their page. I have to do this. It's your job. It's your job. Just become undeniable. Become so dope that people just got to be either affiliated with you. They got to be close to you. They got to be next to you. They got to be. And it's not on no, it's not on the level of any vanity. It's just become so dope that everything you do is dope. Like, yeah. you know, you know, think about, uh, what is it? Everybody loves Steve Jobs, but when he wore the black turtleneck and the jeans and all that, it wasn't the, the, the people started emulating that. Yeah. Not because that was a fantastic fashion choice. It was just that the way he viewed the world, the things he did, the products that he brought forth, the, um, the complexity yet simplicity of the things he was doing in his industry made him so dope that he just became undeniable. Everything that he did just seemed like it was planned or it was a part of the part of the scheme or part of the pitch. And it's like not always. It was just right. They like so, like I wait, I'm gonna emulate everything, so I might be able to get something. Yeah, yeah. Become so dope. Post the dopest stuff. Um, have the dopest product, give do giveaways, do we do community service, make that be impactful when you um you know when you're just being silly, make even your silliness impactful. Mm. Everything. Just it just leave it all on the floor. Leave it all there. You ain't taking none of this with you. Leave it all out as a business owner. Just like as stupid as it sounds, I know it sounds so I'm gonna look silly, I'm gonna look stupid. But you made an impression on somebody, even if yeah. you look, even looking stupid, you made an impression on somebody. Nah, that's nah, that's amazing, man. Look, bro, I, 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 I said, don't take it personal, baby. Just go hard. Yeah. Nah, man. I, I man, I love that, man. And don't think I ain't going. You watch, you, watch how much you see me posting now. Nah, for real. Like, see, that, but that's been. I mean, that's been like. Look, I gotta. I'm. I'm. Um. I'm, I'm in a scale stage now, right? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It's like it's like it's it's time to scale. And so you but like you said, be gotta be undeniable with it. Gotta be undeniable with it. But man, bro, I'm so grateful you came through today. We probably gonna pick this conversation up again. I got a feeling we I gotta have you back on here because uh you talking about you about to open up another one. You might have to do a live from the spot or something like that. Number one, because uh honestly, so many people need what you have. I mean, of course, from the from the physical therapy services, but also the drive the entrepreneurial spirit and even like you said the excellence that 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 luna that lunacy um I'm gonna have to take my kids there even though you know like they um they they in Prince George's County but now they gotta come to the flagship you know take them down there get on a bus say look this is what this is what it looks like um to 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 do this. 
when the lunacy becomes normal, that's what you want. Like when the when 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 the obsession with what you're doing to be the best becomes normal, that's when you got something. And I feel really blessed. I have a fantastic team. I have people who are just as obsessed with being great as I am. Mm. They wanna they want to be a part of something that's impactful in the community. But, um not only in locally but nationwide like you know the, the, that's it, it's just so um, it's, they inspire me with how hard they go so believe me please bring your kids um bring um, i would love to do another one of these yeah i would love to, um, I would love to do maybe a live q a so people can really you know get get questions you know I'm I'm a wealth of knowledge, man. I know that's a real. People, a lot of people want to know, you know, how how to scale, how to do certain things, even from the mental health aspect of it. Because I'm really big on that. Because a lot of business owners aren't, you know, heavy. They neglect that part of themselves. They neglect that mental health side. Mm-hmm. And um, I've I've had a conversation with you before. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, this drive to be great is it's a lonely road. And, you know, it's important that you're taking care of your mental health. It's it's a it's a ton of things that we can touch on to um to make sure that we're getting the word out. We're talking about business, we're talking about um growth, because this is how our communities um this is how we can scale our communities. This is how we can improve our schools. It's all it's all intertwined. It's all mm-hmm. connected. It's all connected. Y'all, this has been another episode of Friends with Businesses, where I introduce you to my friends with businesses, and I know that you benefit. We've proved it once again. Uh, thanks so much to my big brother, Dr. Raphael J. Dembo II. Outside J working, watch how quickly I drop 50. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, man, and we are out.